would everyone please rise for the singing of the national anthem. Gentlemen, the president of the Jack and Bear Hebrew Academy Board of Directors, Mrs. Michelle Levin. Mrs. Levin, Dr. Katz, Mrs. Farrell, Mr. Stroker, faculty, staff, members of the classes of 1957 and 1967, parents, grandparents, family members, alumni, rabbinic and community leaders, and all other guests, and of course, the members of the class of 2017. Good evening. <laughs> That's it, I used my two minutes. Um, good evening, and welcome to Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy's 67th commencement exercises. I am honored to stand before you as the president of the board of directors during the 70th year of this amazing institution. On behalf of our school, I extend our appreciation to Har Zion Temple for so graciously hosting us this evening. It is my pleasure to welcome and recognize Len Barrett, class of 1960, and Lynn Barrett. We are greatly honored by your presence <laughs> and your ongoing extraordinary support in so many ways. To my fellow board members and trustees, together with whom I am so privileged to work. I express my, debt, my gratitude for your dedication and support. I want, to, excuse me, I want to extend a special mazel tov to three of our board members who have children graduating this evening, Jerry Gordon, Holly Nelson, and Belinda Reagan. <laughs> Jonathan Sachs writes, the fate of the Jews in the diaspora was, is, and predictably will be determined by their commitment to Jewish education. Parents of the class of 2017, the school is both honored and grateful that you chose a barrack education for your children. As the parent of three alumni, I can assure you that that education they received continues to positively influence their decisions they make and how they live their lives. All right. To the class of 2017, you are a remarkable class, continuing on to 41 different institutions of higher education with locations throughout this country. In this week's Parsha, we read, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and say to him, when you light the lamps, the seven lamps shall cast their light toward the face of the menorah. Aaron did so. He lit the lamps toward the face of the menorah as the Lord had commanded Moses. There are two themes in this parsha that resonate. First, when you light a candle, you must hold the kindling to the wick until it lights up on its own, as we do with the shamas on Hanukkah and lighting the menorah. It is said, kindle the flame until it rises by itself. This is the definition of your life until now. Your parents, family, and teachers have been preparing you 
kindling your light to go out into the world independently. There is also the must-discuss statement, Aaron did so. According to Rashi, Aaron did so is in praise of Aaron since he did not deviate from the commandment. The question is, why such praise for doing what he was supposed to do? What do we learn from this? It is said that Aaron did it with humility and enthusiasm, and his enthusiasm and motivation for doing this simple task never diminished over almost 40 years. He always lit the menorah with kavanah. My wish for you, the class of 2017, is to take the flame that has been kindled and approach all you do in life with kavanah. There are many people in your lives who have supported you and made sacrifices for you to reach this milestone. Most of those people are here with you this evening and they deserve recognition for their part in this special moment. Seniors, please give your parents, grandparents, friends, faculty, and staff a round of applause for how they have brought you to this time. On behalf of the Board of Directors of Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy, I congratulate each one of you. Yashar Kalach, and may you go from strength to strength as you embark on the next phase of your life and academic career. In this week's parasha, the Halotaha, the Israelites leave Mount Sinai, where they had been camped for nearly a year, and they begin their journey to Canaan. As the Israelites set out on their journey, they are guided by a cloud over the Mishkan. This cloud is understood by many to represent the Spirit of God. In Parsha Pekudeh, when the Mishkan is completed, we learn that the cloud of Hashem would be upon the Mishkan by day and fire would be on it at night, before the eyes of all of the house of Israel throughout their journeys. There is a Midrash that says, when B'nai Yisrael saw God's cloud resting over the Mishkan, they rejoiced and said, Now Hashem is pleased with us. However, at night, when the cloud was gone, they cried out in despair. When the cloud is over the Mishkan, the Israelites feel safe and protected. Now, when the Israelites journey to Canaan, the same cloud hangs over the Mishkan to guide the Israelites. In the parasha, it says, the Lord's cloud kept above them by day. Rashi comments that there are actually seven clouds accompanying the Israelites on their journey. There is a cloud in each of the four directions, one above, one below, and a seventh cloud leading them, lowering the ascents, raising the descents, and killing snakes and scorpions. Although the Israelites have a long and difficult journey ahead of them, we know they will succeed on their journey because of the cloud guiding them. We are about to embark on all of our own separate journeys as we set out for college and gap year programs next year. Just as the Israelites had become comfortable living at Mount Sinai, we have become comfortable at Barak. We have all been at Barak for several years now. We are familiar with the school, our friends, and our teachers. We feel safe and secure at Barak. As excited as we all are to start this new chapter of our lives, it is also intimidating. We are going to be pushed out of our comfort zones, we will be in unfamiliar places, and we will have new friends and teachers. However, we have the, ed the education and the lessons that we have learned at Barrick to guide us. Even though we are physically leaving Barrick and each other, Barrick will always be a part of all of us. So just as the Israelites succeeded on their journey and reached the land of Canaan with the help of the cloud guiding them, we too can have faith that we will succeed and accomplish all of our goals with the preparation and guidance that Barak has given us. חברים, הורים, מורים ואורחים נכבדים, ברוכים הבאים לטקס הסיום של בית ספר ברק, מחזור 2017. שמעתי שהקהל יהיה סבלני איתי אם אעשה נאום בשפה זרה. 
אז התנדבתי לשאת את הנאום הזה בעברית היום. אולם, אילו זה באמת היה המניע שלי, המורים שלי היו מאוכזבים ממני. אחרי הכל, בבית ספר ברק לימדו אותי אף פעם לא להירתע מאתגר. זה אחד מהדברים הכי חשובים שתלמידי כיתתי ואני ניקח איתנו מזמן שלנו פה. הידיעה שאנחנו מסוגלים ליותר ממה שאנחנו יודעים. החברים שלי ואני ממיתים מעצמנו וחושבים שאנחנו לא מסוגלים להתמודד עם דבר חדש. אבל המורים שלנו החדירו בנו שאפתנות שמאפילה על הספקות האלה. איכשהו הם יודעים יותר טוב ממנו שאם אנחנו נחושים בדעתנו, אנו יכולים להשיג כל דבר. אני מסתכלת על הכיתה שלי ורואה אנשים בלתי ניתנים לעצירה. התלמידים בכיתה זו הם מבריקים אבל צנועים, עובדים קשה ומרוכזים, אך יחד עם זאת יודעים לקייף. עצובים להתרחק אחד מהשני, אך בטוח כבר מוכנים לצאת לעולם הגדול. למרות שאנחנו עדיין לא לגמרי מבינים זאת, אני חושבת שארבע השנים האחרונות לימדו אותנו הרבה על עצמנו ואחד על השני. לדוגמה, איך עוד היינו מגלים שאנו יכולים לתפקד אחרי רק ארבע או חמש שעות של שינה, או לגור עם אותה קבוצה של תלמידים שלושה חודשים בלי להשתגע. אנחנו אמנם נפרדים מן המורים שעשו לנו ללמוד את הדברים האלה והמקום שבו למדנו, אבל אנחנו לוקחים איתנו את כל שלמדנו פה. למדנו הרבה בכיתה, וכמו כן גם למדנו רבות מחוץ לה. הזמן שלנו בישראל זו הדוגמה הכי טובה לכך. בישראל למדנו על עצמאות, על תלות הדדית ועל איך חברים הופכים למשפחה. ספגנו את הסביבה עם התלהבות ללמוד כמה שיותר על המדינה היהודית. באותו זמן שהכרנו אחד את השני טוב יותר, הכרנו גם את עצמנו, והתגעגענו לאלה שנשארו בארצות הברית. הכיתה שלנו התקרבה והתכוננה לשנה האחרונה שלנו יחד. כולנו יושבים פה היום, ואני עדיין לא מוכנה לומר שלום. הדבר האחד שעוזר לי הוא לחשוב עד כמה אנו נבונים, בעלי מוטיבציה ומיוחדים, ועוד נעיר חלקים שונים של המדינה, ואפילו של מדינת ישראל. אני מקנאה בכל המוסדות שיש להם את הזכות לקבל כל אחד מהתלמידים האלה השנה, כי מוסדות אלה עדיין לא מודעים לזכות שנפלה בחלקם. למשל, American University עוד לא יודעת שהיא מקבלת את הנשיא העתידי בנועם. יש עוד. ברנדייס וברנארד עוד לא יודעים שדבי ורבקה יוכיחו עצמן כרופאות מפורסמות. ב-NYU עוד תראה שסרה נלסון תיקח חלק בכמה מהסרטים המוצלחים ביותר של העתיד. <אז> יש אנשים בכיתה שלנו שיודעים, או לפחות חושבים שהם יודעים, בדיוק מה הם רוצים לעשות וללמוד, בזמן שאחרים, כמוני, פוחדים מההחלטות האלה. היה לי מספיק קשה לבחור צבע לשיער שלי, ובקרוב אני אצטרך לבחור מקצוע ראשי. החיים המבוגרים כבר נראים פחות מושכים, במיוחד כי למרות הבגרות שלנו, אנחנו בקרוב נהפוך לדגים הקטנים באגם. תלמידי אוניברסיטה מנוסים כבר אומרים לנו שאיננו יודעים מה מצפה לנו. אולי הם צודקים, ואנחנו באמת לא יודעים למה לחכות. אבל אני מקווה שאתם יודעים מי אתם, כשאתם נכנסים לשלב הבא של חייכם. אני מקווה שאתם מודעים לתכונות הטובות הרבות שלכם. אני מקווה שאתם מכירים את החולשות שלכם ואוהבים את עצמכם למרותן. התערובת הזאת של יכולות, חולשות, תכונות מוזרות וכישרונות מובילה אתכם בכיוון החלומות שלכם ושומרת לכם מקומות שאין להם תחליף בינינו. אני יודעת שהיו לנו עליות ומורדות, אבל היום כל מה שחשוב הוא שהגענו לכאן. לאלה שלא מריחים את זה מספיק, אזכיר לכם את הימים הראשונים שלנו בבית ספר התיכון. ראינו את התלמידים בכיתה י"ב, תהינו מי יהיו חברינו, ותיארנו לעצמנו את היום הרחוק שבו אנחנו נהיה הכיתה שעוזבת את בית הספר וקובעת את המורשת שלנו. היום הרחוק הזה הוא היום, 
ולמרות שכמה אנשים עזבו אותנו, אפשר לומר שהגענו בשלום לסוף הרפתקה אחת ולראשה של הרפתקה חדשה. לגבי המורשת שלנו, אנחנו כמובן נשאיר את המורים עם דמעות בעיניהם ותוהים איך היו יכולים להחזיק בתלמידים כל כך מדהימים לעוד קצת זמן. זאת לפחות המורשת שאני מדמיינת, ואני מקווה שזה לא רחוק מדי מהאמת. אסיים את נאומי בכמה ברכות לכולנו. אני מקווה שבעודנו מתחילים את המסע הארבע שנתי החדש, פחד הוא לא הרגש המנחה אותנו. איך אנו יכולים להיכנס אל העתיד בפחד אחרי שהתגברנו על המכשולים הכי מפחידים שיש? המבחן על חוקת ארצות הברית, הפעם הראשונה שראינו את יחידת המעגל, המראה של הסלון שלנו, ואפילו המתח שהרגשנו כשחיכנו לראות איזה תמונה מכוערת שלנו יבחרו לספירה לאחור של חמישים יום. אני מקווה שבמקום פחד, הכוחות המקוונים אותנו יהיו שאפתנות, מזג נעים, חוכמה, חוכמה שממשיכה להתפתח, סקרנות בריאה וביטחון בפוטנציאל שלנו. התמודדנו עם תוכנית מלאה, שפות שונות והמון פעילויות מחוץ לתוכנית הלימודים. עכשיו הגיע הזמן להתגאות בעצמנו ולהזכיר לעצמנו שההצלחה שלנו טרם הסתיימה. חשוב יותר, הקשר שלנו לא הסתיים פה. הזיכרונות מארבע השנים האלה הם יותר מדי רבים ויותר מדי נמרצים בשביל לשכוח אותם. אין לי ספק בכך שהכוח שלהם ימשוך אותנו אחד אל השני ויוודא שדרכנו ימשיכו להצטלב. אלה היו העונג וזכות היתר שלי, לא רק לחלוק יחד את דרכו של כל אחד מכם, אך גם ללכת בדרכי, של... בדרכי שלי בביטחון עם הידידות שלכם, התמיכה שלכם וההשראה שקיבלתי מכם. אני מקווה שכל היחסים בחיים שלכם יהיו מגשימים כמו אלה שבניתם פה, ושכל המכרים החדשים שלכם יעניקו לכם ידידות חזקה ואמיתית. כמו הידידות שנתתם לי ולכל אחד מאיתנו. עלו והצליחו. Good evening. It is my privilege to introduce this evening's commencement speaker, Hanan Tige, class of 1994. He is one of... Yeah. He is one of four brothers who attended Akiba and son of Helene Tige, a longtime faculty member, and Professor Rabbi Jeff Tige, renowned Bible scholar and longtime professor at the University of Pennsylvania, who himself was an Akiba commencement speaker. Hanan Tige is an award-winning journalist, author, and current assistant professor at San Francisco State University, where he teaches creative writing. He received a BA from the University of Pennsylvania and an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. Professor Tige has worked as a correspondent where he covered news on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the church abuse scandal, and issues within the United Nations. In this role, he also interviewed prominent Israeli leaders such as former President Shimon Peres. Hanan was a senior writer for the Jerusalem Report magazine where he, wrote where he wrote investigative articles about Israeli politics, and he acted as an analyst for television and radio shows. In 2011 to 2012, he was awarded the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism's Investigative Reporting Fellowship, where he worked on a series of projects about the Middle East, mainly focusing on the US-Israel relationship. Over the course of his career, he has also written for Newsweek, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Wall Street Journal, and the New Yorker. Our families are all grateful to have been given copies of Hanan Tige's new book entitled, The Lost Book of Moses, The Hunt for the World's Oldest Bible. We so appreciate the fact that you've traveled all the way from Berlin, Germany, where you and your family are spending the semester to be with us here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Hanan Tige.
Thank you, Elise, for that very generous introduction. Uh, Lynn and Len Barrick, dear Mrs. Levin, devoted members of the board, esteemed faculty and staff, great-looking alumni, <laughs> Mrs. Judy Schrager and Mrs. Leslie Pugash, both retiring this year after a combined 64 years teaching. And especially, members of the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy class of 2017. <laughs> Mazel tov to everyone in this room. This is a very big deal. Graduates, look out for a minute at all the people who've come tonight to celebrate your achievements. You should be as proud of yourselves as they are of you. You've worked incredibly hard to get here, and now you've made it. Thank you, first off, so much for inviting me, addressing you tonight, and on the 70th anniversary of the school's founding, no less, is an extraordinary honor. It's also, I must admit, an extraordinary surprise. It's an honor because this is my home. Uh, at heart, I'm an Akiba Barrett guy, born and bred. When I think back on my life thus far, it's really Akiba where I began to form a sense of my own identity, my place in the world, as a human being and also as a Jew. It was here I learned that you could have a family outside your nuclear family, that thanks to Dewey Oriente, acting in musical theater could be cool, <laughs> that as my wonderful teacher, Mrs. Panina Howarth, told me, the word Hebrew in Akiba Barrett Hebrew Academy referred not to the language, but to Jewish peoplehood, to being a Hebrew. And being a Hebrew is both a religious affiliation and a way of thinking and being in the world. Akiba also instilled in me an important quality that has propelled me through life and annoyed my wife, a profoundly exaggerated sense of my athletic abilities. <laughs> but not only that, when I was a little kid, my mom was Akiba's school psychologist and later college admissions counselor before she became a Jewish studies teacher. And every day after school, my brother Yis and I would walk from the old Schefter building on Highland Avenue over to Akiba, where our older brothers, Eitan and Hillel, were already students. Their friends called us the Tiglitz. <laughs> All four of us, as you heard before, eventually graduated from here. Akiba truly was our second home. But even so, being here tonight is also a surprise for me. And that's because, first of all, it feels like it wasn't all that long ago that I sat right where you're sitting today, a proud graduate, chomping at the bit for the ceremony to end so I could toss my cap up in the air and get on with my life. But be patient. There are precious few moments in life when an entire community, an entire family, gathers together to acknowledge your accomplishments. Savor this. It's also surprising that I'm here because I think not too many people would have guessed that I'd be here talking to you today. Just weeks before my graduation, the college counselor called me into her office to inform me that I had the worst case of senioritis she'd seen in decades of such work. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> A short while later, I was called into the vice principal's office where I was informed that I was failing trigonometry and needed a C on the final if I was hoping to graduate. That was less cool. That meeting was like penicillin for my senioritis. I studied hard, I prayed hard, and I got a D. <laughs> Somehow, I was still allowed to graduate. Now, the previous year, while I was in Israel as part of my junior semester in Jerusalem, a few of my close friends and I got in some trouble for breaking a few rules and were nearly sent home. Now, I wasn't invited here tonight to reminisce, <laughs> but to offer some thoughts that I hope might be useful to all of you as you begin the next chapters of your lives. So here's the first thought. I was a good kid, but at just about your age, at the very same school, I did some pretty dumb things. But the moment I received my diploma, as you will in just a few minutes, 
The slate was wiped clean. No one I met from there on in had to know about any of the stupid things I'd done. Graduating was a new beginning. The same is true for you. So take advantage of this new beginning to truly assess. Ask yourselves, who am I? And who do I want to become? And remember, you don't get many chances for new beginnings in life. This is a unique moment because people are still willing to chalk up indiscretions to your youth. But you won't be young for long. One day, not too long from now, you'll wake up in the morning and your back will hurt <laughs> just from sleeping on it. And that's when you'll know you've reached adulthood. So use this opportunity well. And there's more good news. Because while anything you're not proud of having done can now fade into the background as you begin to further investigate exactly who you are, all the good stuff, the stuff you're proud of, remains. That's the second point I'd like to make. Your lives are full of ridiculous amounts of good stuff. The very fact that you're sitting here tonight as graduates of this phenomenal school means that you have already won the lottery. Do you have any idea how much your parents must love you and believe in you and support you to spend the kind of money it costs to receive such an extraordinary education? The answer is a lot. You've won the parent lottery. But winning the lottery is a double-edged sword. Some lottery winners take their winnings, buy Ferraris, and crash them into trees. Others spend their new cash more wisely. They invest, they donate, they create. So point three, as you get ready to head off to college, remember that you have a choice. You can blow your winnings, sleeping late, skipping classes, taking part in unsavory fraternity rituals involving goat's heads and Guinness. <laughs> or you can take your winnings and consolidate them. Have fun. For God's sake, you should enjoy college. But remember why you're there. Choose wisely. By way of example as to what choosing wisely might lead to, here's what a few other Akiba Barrett graduates have ended up doing with their lottery winnings. You could be a major Hollywood movie producer who founds a national organization pushing for a cure for autism, like John Shestak, class of 1977. You could marry your classmate. <laughs> and together, you could found an international wildlife and nature conservancy organization like Rebecca Goldstone and Michael Stern, both class of 1996. You could speak truth to power as a journalist like Eli Lake and Ami Eden, class of 1991, or Jake Tapper, class of 1987. You could be the starting center on the Portland Trailblazers like... <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, wrong list here. But you could be like Leia Apple, class of 2009, a hip-hop dancing, Fulbright-winning, film-producing medical student. Or you could be like Dan Bricklin, class of 1969 and son of Akiba science teacher Ruth Bricklin. Dan invented the spreadsheet. Or you could be like the many doctors and rabbis and lawyers and cantors and professors and educators that this school has gifted the world. Like your predecessors, your options are endless, as is your capacity to do well and to do good in the world if you choose wisely. And here's another advantage Barrick has given you. Before setting foot on a college campus, many of you know three languages. The average American knows one language, English, but you know three. So point four, keep studying those languages or learn new ones. Travel to places where you can use them, learning about foreign cultures and about people who are different than you are. Then bring your experiences back to your classmates and your campuses and your communities and let these experiences inspire you to work for deeper inclusion of outsiders, for social justice, and for greater tolerance of, in of difference. Speaking of which, I was so proud when I heard that Barrick was the first day school to establish a gender-neutral bathroom, that this extraordinary gesture was dedicated to Patrick Brock, class of 2005, and the child of one of my favorite teachers, Mrs. Brock, only served to highlight its profound meaning. Barrick and its students practiced what they preach. 
You are already a light unto the nations. You already embody the Jewish values of inclusivity, tolerance of difference, and respect. Just over a week ago, we celebrated the holiday of Shavuot, during which we marked the giving of the Torah to the children of Israel. This commencement marks a similar milestone in your lives, the giving of an education to you, children of Israel, class of 2017. But, as you surely already know, the story in Sefer Shemot doesn't stop when God gives the Torah to the Jews. It goes on to tell us about how the Jews accepted the Torah. Here's what it says. Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, Na'aseh v'nishma, we will do and we will hear. The order of the words here is important. The Jews' response to receiving the Torah is first that they will do everything God commands them. Only then will they nishma, listen, hear, study the law. I struggle with exactly what lesson to glean from such blind obedience. But I do appreciate the important duality represented here of both action and learning. No matter what order you choose to do them in, I hope you will continue to na'aseh v'nishma, to take action to better the world and to study those sources that will help you do so. Which leads to point five. Your work toward tikkun olam, repairing the world, is not yet done. It should not stop when you leave here this evening. Similarly, graduation is not the end of your Jewish education. It's only the end of the beginning. On this point, let me quote my all-time favorite rabbi, my dad, <laughs> from his commencement speech to Akiba's class of 1999. He said, don't make the mistake of thinking that because you are a day school graduate, you already know what there is to know about Jewish studies. Instead, realize that because you are a day school graduate, you are capable of studying Judaism on an exciting, advanced level. Your Jewish education is both a privilege and a responsibility. Now, as Elise mentioned, I've been living in Berlin for the last six months. It's an amazing city, huge, cosmopolitan, endlessly fascinating. But it's also weighted by its heavy history. I'm living in a house where the Nazi's economic minister lived during the war. Right across the lake is the Wannsee Conference House, where a group of 15 maniacs approved the so-called final solution of the Jewish question. A week in Berlin can't but remind you why Israel remains indispensable. You've all learned about Israel, studied its history, Several of you were heading there for a gap year before starting college. Barak's strong Zionist ethos doesn't mean you have to agree with everything Israel does, but you now have a mandate to engage in a wider discussion about the Jewish state. Doing so, however, is becoming increasingly perilous on college campuses. At the university where I teach, Jerusalem's mayor came to visit and was hounded off the stage by the school's general union of Palestinian students shouting, long live the intifada, and get off our campus. They actually shouted slightly saltier language that I won't repeat here in front of Mrs. Levin <laughs> and my mom. <laughs> but shutting down free speech is unacceptable at any university, which first and foremost should be centers of civil and open dialogue. But that's the reality you're headed into. Don't let anyone silence you or say you don't have the right to support Israel or if you dis disagree with a particular policy, to say so. So point six, the knowledge you acquired here at Barrick is not inanimate matter meant to be warehoused in your brains. Knowledge is alive and is meant to be wielded. So wield it. Which brings me to point seven. I played halfback on the Akiba boys soccer team. And when I was in 10th grade, we made it into the Tri-County League Championship game. We were thrilled to be there, of course, but a little nervous too. We were playing against a school whose students had repeatedly demonstrated exactly what they thought of Jews. They'd drawn swastikas into the grime on the tennis team's bus, tossed pennies at the basketball team, and on this fall afternoon, as we proceeded to beat the pants of them, I should mention, their increasingly agitated fans began chanting, P-L-O, P-L-O, P-L-O. Not missing a beat, Matt Bessin, our stalwart midfielder, began a counter chant. U-S-Y, U-S-Y, U-S-Y. 
we all lost it out on the field. And I tell you this story first to reiterate my earlier point. Don't stay silent in the face of unfair attacks. And I mention it also to urge you to keep a sense of humor about things. The world is a serious place. It's also ridiculous. These are trying times, to be sure, but there's also so much good in the world. College can be competitive, but also mind-blowing. And among other important Jewish traditions, including lactose intolerance, bloating, and indigestion, <laughs> maintaining a sense of humor, even in trying times, is a surefire way to keep a healthy perspective on things. To quote Maimonides, laughter is the best medicine, except for real medicine. <laughs> Any of you who think Maimonides really said that, needs to go back and repeat Rabbi Yandor's Jewish ethics class. <laughs> now, my career path hasn't had a straightforward trajectory. There have been many zigs and many zags. When I graduated from Akiba, I wanted to be an actor. And while I was in college, I was cast in the Philadelphia production of an off-Broadway play where I made my entrance while hanging out the trunk of a speeding taxi cab, holding tight to a coffin that was sticking out to the back, and all this while wearing an electric blue suit and kippah. When I graduated college, I was cast in an independent movie by an Academy Award-nominated director. My acting career, I was certain, was in full gear. But when I arrived on set for the first day of filming, the director told me he'd hired an entirely foreign crew, not one of whom had a valid driver's license. And so, just like that, I became the movie star slash van driver shuttling the other actors to and from the Newark train station. On the third day of filming, I backed the van into another car, causing $4,000 of damage. The film was never released. <laughs> when shooting wrapped, I sent out dozens and dozens of headshots and resumes, and for some reason I just can't figure out, I got callbacks almost exclusively to audition for the role of Muttle the Taylor in several productions of Fiddler on the Roof. I saw myself as more of a Matt Damon type, and so this was disconcerting. <laughs> My acting career was supposed to take me to Hollywood, and instead I was on the fast track back to Anatevka. <laughs> and so I decided to make a change. I'd always thought that being a journalist sounded interesting and important, and I managed to find a job at a small newspaper on Long Island. There, I was the chief staff writer, which is to say, the only staff writer. I learned the ropes, and when the second intifada broke out, I bought a plane, to, plane ticket to Israel, where I was hired as a correspondent in the Jerusalem bureau of Agence France Presse, the French AP. I had to cover some gruesome things there. And before I left for Israel, my parents made me promise that every time there was a new attack, I would call home to tell them I was OK. And I'm pretty sure I wasn't the only reporter at some of these attack sites who pretended he was calling his editor while actually dialing his mom. The work in Israel was fascinating, but when you write for a wire service, creativity is discouraged. Injecting any kind of personality into your writing is discouraged. And so I decided to go back to school to learn how to infuse my work with what we call voice. Only now, I turned my attention to writing fiction. But what I realized writing fiction in graduate school was that I missed aspects of journalism especially the ability to go out into the field and talk to real people and engage with them and ask them questions, sometimes highly personal questions, that I could never get away with asking strangers in real life. For example, so how's life? What would you do if you were prime minister? What was it like to send your child off to war? And what was it like when he didn't come home? And as I made my way through school, I began combining aspects of fiction and nonfiction, telling true stories rooted firmly in fact, but doing so using all the literary tools of the fiction writer that I was studying. All of which ultimately led me to write the book that Elise mentioned in her introduction. I mention all this as a preamble to the final two points. I love what I do, but getting here hasn't always been easy. In fact, it's rarely been easy. Even so, I wouldn't change a thing, except for several haircuts in the mid to late 90s. <laughs> so point eight, find something you love to do and do it. Do it with all your heart and all your soul. Do it when it's easy to do and when it's hard to do. 
Give it every ounce of energy you can muster. Do it when you're encouraged to do it, and do it even harder when people tell you you can't. And there will be naysayers. Don't ignore them. Take their criticism to heart. Learn from them, painful as it may be. Make whatever course corrections need to be made, and then don't dwell on them. And keep doing what you love, whether it's physics or music, law or Jewish studies, writing or teaching or acting or cooking. Don't give up just because someone else tells you to. You are all smart. You are all talented. But here's something I've learned. The people who succeed doing something they love, they aren't necessarily the smartest or the most talented. What they have in common is that they worked harder than everyone else. They napped less frequently. When they got knocked down, they got back up. When they got knocked down again, they got back up again. The zigs and zags along the way were sometimes frustrating, but no such detour was ever worthless. That's because, as it turns out, you can learn as much from failure as from success. If you are thoughtful and reflective and sensitive, you can learn from everything you try your hand at. And what you learn can propel you forward or inform your life in some new and unexpected way or make you better at whatever it is you're trying to do. Which brings me to point nine. There is no one right path to get where you're going. You may already know exactly what you want to do with your life and just how you'd like to get there, and that's fantastic. But always remember, the right path may not be a direct one. Like me, there may be zigs and zags. There will be obstacles and disappointments. You will back the van into the car. But if you love what you do, whether it's your major or ultimately your life's pursuit, you need to grab onto it with all your strength and not let go even if the ride gets rough. That can be risky, but that's okay. Big risks merit big rewards. But be smart. Take risks, but wear a helmet. Be realistic, but not pessimistic. If your dream is, in fact, to play in the NBA, and you look like me, consider plan B. <laughs> if you're only getting callbacks to play Malto the Taylor and this doesn't make you happy, find something else you love and start doing it at full speed. Changing course is okay, but do it on your terms. Don't let anyone else tell you you can't do what you want to do. So I've probably made it sound like I've got it all figured out. I don't. But I have figured one thing out, the tenth and final point. Happiness and fulfillment do not come from the outside, from what others think and say about you. Happiness and fulfillment come from inside, from abiding by your own sense of right and wrong, good and bad, moral and immoral, worthwhile, or a waste of energy. I recently received a very bad Amazon review of my book. The reviewer disagreed vehemently with my conclusions and left me a dreaded one-star rating. Then he ended his review by saying, I have to admit, though, that I skipped the first 17 chapters. Do not let outside opinion hold your happiness and satisfaction hostage. They may not know your whole story. They may not know exactly what you're trying to accomplish. They may have skipped your first 17 chapters. What matters isn't what they think of you. It's what you think of you. So in conclusion, members of the class of 2017, work hard, don't do drugs, study a lot, play a lot, call your parents, spend wisely, Approach everything you do with all the energy you can muster. Choose your friends wisely. Use spell check. Don't wear white after Labor Day. Don't wear Crocs ever. Be kind to waiters. Tell your parents you love them. Don't put compromising pictures on your Instagram pages. Read a lot. Never forget, but also don't hold grudges. Help other people. Learn to do your own laundry. Never order the ravioli, they only bring you like four pieces. <laughs> keep learning languages, keep engaged with Judaism and Israel, travel a lot, come home a lot, and finally, look out into the audience one more time now. And as you do, remember, no matter where you go and what you do, you've always got a family waiting for you back here at Barrick, proud of you, curious about what you're up to, ready to offer a shoulder or lend a hand. Now, go out into the world and keep doing good. Mazel tov, and go Cougars!
members of the board of directors, distinguished Akiba Barrett alumni from the classes of 1957 and 1967, Mrs. Levin, Dr. Katz, Mrs. Farrell, teachers, parents, friends, and guests. Thank you all for being here to celebrate with the class of 2017. To my friends, the Barrett class of 2017, we are all on the brink of a great change. Whether we are ready or not, a vastly different world is in front of us. As I contemplate the future, I am really excited. But to tell you the truth, I am also scared. I've spoken to many of you and learned that I am not alone. For many of us, this immense transition feels truly frightening. Because change, by definition, comes with loss and letting go of what were once the defining factors of our lives. Class of 2017, we've already started letting go. I see this in the way so many of us are looking back at our time at Barrick through rose-colored glasses. I would consider myself pretty cynical. <laughs> but these days, I've begun to appreciate the quirks of JBHA, including the fact that our head of school wears a dress made of old newspapers <laughs> to the first day of school to remind us that it is a Shana Hadasha, a new year. So on this threshold between high school and college, adolescence and adulthood, dependence and independence, we are rewriting the story of our years together. We've begun appreciating all those ordinary days at Barrick where nothing special really happened. Remember when we were all so eager for snow days? Checking snow day calculator religiously throughout the day? On a few occasions, I felt genuinely angry at God for the fact that it snowed on weekends and not on a school day. But what we could not see then, yet feels so powerfully true today, is those ordinary barrack days from which we felt so desperate for a break were themselves precious and beautiful. The simple routine of getting a late pass for stopping at Wawa at 810, <laughs> of being interrupted during class by announcements of the names of middle schoolers who needed to go to the office, <laughs> and of failing history reading quizzes were sources of stability and balance. Some things, however, do not need to be filtered through nostalgia and are fundamentally true to the Barrett experience. The strong and personal relationships we made with teachers and staff, the underlying shared beliefs that hold us together, and the genuine care people here have for one another are unique to this school and not to be taken for granted. Sometimes we felt stressed by work or friends, but we always knew where we were headed the next day. School was like Cheers, where everyone knows your name. And though that reference is well before my time, I think it still works. <laughs> Having that place where everyone knew who we were where everyone cared about our well-being and where we knew we could always come back, that was a blessing. Class of 2017, we are entering a great unknown, an utterly new and foreign place. It will be a place where nobody knows our name and where not everybody cares how we are doing or what we are feeling. We are transitioning to something totally new. And while that is exciting, to me, it feels like a kind of grief. My parents are both rabbis, so my childhood included conversations about grief 
and loss, along with Barney and Sesame Street. So I will use Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's famous five stages of grief to articulate what it can be like to go through a change like the one we face today. Step one, denial. Many of us, still unconsciously, are in denial of the powerful shift before us. It is still so distant and unfathomable. Leaving home is such a big concept that, to me at least, always seemed so far away from my reality. I think many of us find ourselves feeling like we're still on must. Some of us pathologically stealing other people's food. <laughs> some worshiping core teachers like cult leaders. And some, perhaps foolishly, volunteering to be a translator on Gadna. <laughs> but time has moved on, as it always does. And we are not on must or anywhere else. We are here on this graduation stage. Step two, anger. Some of us are just angry. Angry at the college process, angry at ourselves for feeling scared about the journey ahead, or angry that we never got the ice cream machine back during our high school years. <laughs> Step three, bargaining. Some of us are still bargaining with ourselves. We tell ourselves we'll be home for the holidays anyway. We were the cool kids at the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy. We'll make friends in a day. And yet, we cannot escape how new this will be. Step four, sadness. Some of us simply feel sad about what we are leaving behind. Amazing friendships, a great school, loving homes and comfy beds. It's easy to wonder how we are going to find all of this in a dorm room, in a completely new context. But all of us, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not for months into the next steps on our journeys, will inevitably find step five, acceptance. And we will accept the freeing truth that change is not a part of life. Change is life, dynamic and scary, thrilling and ephemeral. Fear can be paralyzing and all-consuming. We seek comfort in familiar places to push away the darkness of fear and change. Class of 2017, I urge you, do not seek out comfort. Do not attempt to stop inevitable change by clinging to nostalgia. Let's remind ourselves that we are lucky enough to be at the beginning of the rest of our lives. Reach out and grab the next four years, the next 10 years, the next 80, with the courage to know that we can never go back but we can always look forward. Class of 2017, the future is out there. Let's embrace it together. Thank you. After the completion of the Torah on the holiday of Simchat Torah, there is a tradition for the congregation to chant the phrase, Chazak, Chazak, Beni Chazak, meaning, be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. As our class finishes our studies at Barak, it is fitting for us to reflect on the same quote as we move into the next chapter of our lives. As we all go to different schools, pursue different majors and minors, and discover different passions, 
We must remember to thank all of the faculty and staff members at Barrick who have helped us to get to this point today. Thank you for making us strong and thank you for helping each of us to be strengthened. On behalf of the class of 2017, I am thrilled to present the Jack and Barrick Hebrew Academy with the gift of brand new Torah covers. We hope that these new Torah covers will inspire future learning and studies at Barrick and strengthen the minds of students for many years to come. Oh my word, later I will show you the magnificent renditions of these Torah covers. And with our expanded Tefillah Shachari program and our need for additional Torah scrolls, which we've acquired over the last couple of years, these covers will be so, so uh, that you could not have thought of a, of a better gift. It's very touching, and we will think of you all the time as we read from the Torah. Todara Ba. Oh, wow. <laughs> Would the chair of the Alumni Association please come to the podium? Good evening. Congratulations to all of you and your families. I'm Avi Watman Katz, class of 1959, and president of the Akiba Barrack Alumni Association. Tonight, it is with great pride and pleasure that I welcome members of the class of 1957, celebrating their 60th anniversary of their graduation from Akiba, and members of the class of 1967, celebrating the 50th anniversary of their graduation from Akiba Hebrew Academy. Included in your program are some messages written by members of both classes, and we can all take pride in the mark our alumni make in their professions, their communities, and on Jewish life across the country and around the world. It is with great pride and pleasure that we welcome the class of, nine, of 2017 to join the over 2,800 Akiba and Barak alumni worldwide to our association. It is my pleasure to begin our relationship with you by presenting you with a gift from the Alumni Association. Right <laughs> Hannah, Hannah um, please come forward and uh, accept this lovely gift on behalf of your classmates. These are stadium blankets. So we hope you have warm memories as you journey ahead. Thank you. Enjoy. <laughs> Dear graduates, please stay in touch and visit with us soon and often. We look forward to hearing about your achievements and to sharing them with your Akiba Barak family. Mazal Tov to all of you. Good evening, Eric Tov. Um, to begin my brief remarks, I would first like to take a moment to recognize our speaker, Hanan Tige. Not only was Hanan my student a couple of times, but I have known Hanan since he was 10 years old. I, of course, had in my remarks that Hanan was the alum who answered our questionnaire, talking about the overconfidence in his athletic abilities as compared to the rest of the world. But I also remembered Hanan not just as the athlete, but a mainstay of our drama department. Who can forget you in Into the Woods as Prince Charming? 
You had a princely duet with your brother, Yis, who is here with you tonight, and then proclaimed, I was raised to be charming, not sincere. Well, you certainly have grown up to be both and to be passionate. And I urge you all, those of you who are the families of our graduates and received Kainan's book, and I urge everyone else to go out and purchase it. But it speaks of an adventure, of a journey. And Kainan was passionate and is passionate about that journey and adventure. 70 years ago, in 1946, the founders of our school embarked on an adventure. With extraordinary wisdom, abounding hope, and a major dose of chutzpah, they brought 20 students and five teachers together at the Y at Broad and Pine Streets and founded Akiba, the first pluralistic Jewish middle and high school in all of North America. It is amazing to think It is amazing to think that the alumni who are here with us tonight from the class of 1957 graduated when our school was but 11 years old. And you, the class of 1967, graduated at the time of the Six-Day War with Elie Wiesel as your graduation speaker. We didn't intend to tell Hanan that ahead of time because no pressure, Hanan. <laughs> But you did an amazing job. You, the class of 2017, are a class on a journey, an adventure. Rebecca talked about the journey of the Israelites, that ultimate adventure through the desert to Canaan. And Emily, Emily, and hopefully those of you did not understand the Hebrew, and Emily, amazingly, is not a native speaker. It wasn't a native English speaker either when she came to this country. That Emily mentioned your strengths, your weaknesses, your quirks and talents that lead you in the direction of your adventure to the future. You titled your yearbook our adventure book. And the adventure map you drew to the treasure of your senior year is filled with stories of athletic triumphs, a hunger to learn in the classroom, and passion for human rights, cancer awareness, drama, our here Holocaust Awareness and Education Club, tikkun olam, the environment, and always in this class, passion for politics, and Eretz Yisrael. In his speech, Noam referenced that the head of school, and that would be me, starts every year wearing a newspaper dress <coughs> and shouts, Shana Chadasha, Ma Chadash, a new year. What's new? I now say that for each of you, <coughs> excuse me, on your adventure, your journey, Yehiyu Harbei Devarim Chadashim. Excuse me. There will be many new things you will encounter. And all of us here at Barrick, <coughs> sorry, know that with your passion and love and adventure, thank you. <coughs> A little fun. Thing. Know that with your passion. <laughs> I wish I were a ventriloquist, you know. They can drink and talk through their voices. You will embrace everything the future has to offer. And as our founders were trailblazers 70 years ago, so will you find fulfillment on the trails that each of you will blaze. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Darren Katz and Mrs. Christine Fallon to join me to present the diploma.
Sharon Levin, members of the Board of Directors, faculty, family, and guests. I have the distinct pleasure to present to you the members of the class of 2017, <coughs> all of whom have completed the requirements for graduation and are entitled to receive a diploma from the Jack M. Barrett Hebrew Academy. Zoe Brett Patton. Zoe Kastenberg Klein. Jamar Kahana. Stop just for a second. Just in case anyone does not know our Akiva Barrack tradition, the head of school gets stuff. I'm very big on stuff. I like color. I got their calendar, I gather, where they ripped off every day as they approach graduation. It has the days till graduation and their pictures and faces. And I will hang it if I could find any available wall space in my office. <laughs> Matan Yaakov Benabou. <laughs> Allison Bryn Feld. <laughs> Eliza Faye Walker. Ivy Bernstein. <laughs> Emily Hope Greenspan. <laughs> Deborah Miriam Spivak. <laughs> Adam Gregory Mermelstein. <laughs> Natalie Luffman. <laughs> Emily Reinhold. Rebecca Dubovsky. <laughs> Alexander Eli Woods. <laughs> Sarah Lucy Goldfarb. Jacob Hartstein Prince. <laughs> Calling Mr. Seth Maltzman, Akiba Abarak alumnus from the class of 1971, for Noah Maltzman. Calling Rabbi Jeffrey Wolberg, Akiba Barrick alumnus from the class of 1958, for Tamar Joe Wolberg. Calling Mrs. Rebecca Axelrod Cooper, Akiva Barrick alumna from the class of 1987, 
for Ari Benjamin Axelrod Cooper. Jenna Isabel Levin. Gabriella Marie Meltzer. <laughs> Liat Noah Durrani. Mackenzie Nicole Glasner. <laughs> Allison Rachel Grau. <laughs> Yona Meira Hammermet. <laughs> Jacob Alexander Furman. Zachary Scott Lipstein. <laughs> Calling Mrs. Holly Nelson, a member of the Barrett Board of Directors. Sarah Jacqueline Nelson. Gabrielle Simone Posner. <laughs> Ethan Paul Stein. <laughs> Avram Samuel Ford Grossman. Benjamin Max Jacobson. <laughs> Solomon Noah Friedman. <laughs> Yurin Yosef Schmilovich. Calling Mrs. Belinda Rakin, a member of the Barrett Board of Directors. <laughs> Talia Esther Rakin. Alexa Tamarkin. <laughs> Elise Lauren Black. <laughs> Noam Gabriel Glansberg Kramer. <laughs> Thank you. 
You left my coat for a present. Oh. <laughs> Allison Rose Einhorn. <laughs> Jacob Harry Krusky. <laughs> Matan Bree. Manstein. <laughs> no, my turn is to put it this way. Now I have to look at your face. <laughs> I wouldn't say it was a bad thing. Gabriella Rebecca Weitzman. Micha Joshua Weitzman. Right over your sister, right? Lev Friendly Cohen. Nathan Asher Pittock. Andrew Leonard Axelrod. Calling Mr. Martin Hirsch, Akiba Barrick alumnus from the class of 1984, for Ari Benjamin Hirsch. Sarah Melanie Drapkin. <laughs> Calling Mr. Jared Gordon, member of the Barrett Board of Directors. For Simon Harris Gordon. Dr. Alana Eisner, Akiba Barrick alumnus from the class of 1987, and Mr. Ethan Sivan, Akiba Barrick alumnus from the class of 1984, for Rebecca Abigail Sivan. Sharon Levin, members of the Board of Directors, family, faculty, and guests, I am extremely pleased to present to you the Class of 2017.
you wait. Would all seniors and their families please rise for the singing of the Shehechianu? for Hatikva. Join me in wishing congratulations to the class of 2017.